All right, so we are in a series called He Is. And this series, He Is, is based on the seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. If you've been following along, this is week two. And so last week we talked about Jesus being the bread of life, his statement, I am the bread of life. And this week we're going to get into uh, uh, the the next statement, which is, I am the light of the world from John chapter 8. So if you have your Bibles and want to open up or turn your devices on to follow along, we'll be in John chapter 8. Now, the important part of studying this is when Jesus makes these I am statements, he is speaking about his identity. And here's why that's important is because, again, God wants us to know him, not just know about him. And so by telling us who he is, he gives us an understanding of his heart, an understanding of who he is, and an understanding of the purpose that he has for our lives. In knowing him, we will actually know who we truly are. And so honestly, one of the cool things, and and Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians, is that as we contemplate the glory of Jesus, that we ourselves, as followers, if you know him, are being transformed into his image more and more. So this study is not meant just to be an intellectual exercise, but it's actually meant to stir up the soil of your soul, to cultivate new things, and in some cases, pull some weeds And so we're going to do that in both cases this morning, and I'm excited to get into it because what you're going to see in John chapter 8 in this I am statement is that Jesus is the light of the world. His light provides truth, direction, and purpose. And those are the three things we're going to drill down into this morning, truth, direction, and purpose. And so to see what that looks like, first of all, God's light reveals the truth. And we'll talk about what that means. Secondly, God's light provides direction. And finally, God's light gives purpose. So those are big words, and they're meant to be big, but we're going to see how all those things are answered in Jesus' statement, I am the light of the world. So before we get into God's word, and this is so cool because you know what's coming if you've been here for a while. (laughs) We're going to say Psalm 119, 105, but notice the presence of light in this verse. You can say it extra loud if you want to. I won't be afraid. All right, here we go all together. Your word is a lamp for my feet uh, on my path. Very good. All right, cool. So let's give some background into John chapter 8. If you were with us last week, we talked about John chapter 6. And in John chapter 6, Jesus was at the feast of Passover. Now he's working his way through these different symbols from Old Testament ceremonies and Old Testament history. And last week he talked about being the bread of life. And this week he is moving to another festival, one of the three big Jewish festivals. So he starts off at Passover. The second is Pentecost. And the third, six months after Passover, is the Feast of Tabernacles. And so that's where he is going to be in this passage. And he's actually going to be in John chapter 7 and 8. Both of those chapters go together. Now, this festival is an important festival because of the season it's in. It's actually right about now, right? If you're, if you're talking a current Jewish calendar, it's right about now. The Feast of Tabernacles was in the fall. And it was a celebration of the harvest of grapes and of olives, And this is, again, six months after Jesus feeds the 5,000 and then gives the statement that we heard last week that he's the bread of life. Now, this festival was known for water and light ceremonies. And it was meant to symbolize, if you know your Old Testament and have been in Exodus, uh, it's meant to symbolize the wilderness wandering of Israel. They wandered for 40 years, and during that time, God provided water through Moses when he made water come out of the rock, and that's symbolized in the water ceremony. And secondly, he provided light. Now, this is a cool thing, because I I I just love to see this. And if you don't read the Bible with your imagination, you need to start, because it's so cool. When he's leading them during the day by this cloud of his presence, and they're following this cloud, and at night a pillar of fire. So you're not impressed. 
That is so cool. I'm just trying to imagine to see God's presence in this pillar of fire providing direction. They knew that God was with them. And so they celebrate this festival and they do it in two ways. And again, Jesus is going to use these symbols to let people know who he is. He's going to speak to the crowds by using something that they are familiar with and said, you're looking to these symbols, but I am these things in a very real way. He'll use them to teach about his identity. And so first of all, in the water ceremony, and this happens in John chapter 7, and Jesus uses this water ceremony to say this in John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. He says, let, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. I love that idea, right? He's going to keep using these symbols to talk about the spiritual realities of the soul that happen when you believe in Christ, when you trust in Jesus. And then in John chapter 8, he's going to move to the light ceremony. Now, this is just something I don't think we can wrap our brains around, so I want you to engage your imagination right now. So hopefully you have a picture of the temple, right? If you haven't, you can get online and think like, man, big, awesome, not quite as awesome as Solomon's temple, but really big, really cool, in the middle of Jerusalem, boom, bam. And then what's even cooler is during the ceremony they had in the court of the women, they had four huge lamps, and they would fill these lamps with oil. And then they would take, here's a really cool detail. I know I'm just going to nerd out, but hang with me. They would take the old garments from the priest, their old priestly garments, and they would wrap them into a wick. And they would use that old material as the wick to burn the oil. And as a part of that ceremony, they would light these four gigantic lamps. Now, we live in a, in a world of a ton of light pollution, Right? Even when you're in the mountains, if you're in Colorado, you can see this glow coming over the horizon, which is the front range. I don't know if you've been like far, far away from everything. If not, get there because it's awesome. <laughs> but it gets dark. <laughs> like it gets dark at night. When there's no moonlight and it's just straight dark, it gets dark. And so in, in Jerusalem at this time, they didn't have all this ambient light. So when they lit up these gigantic four lamps, <coughs> And though I'm getting too excited. And the light was coming off of, of the, the limestone bricks of the temple. It would have shone like boom. It would have been a spotlight. It would have been this amazing festival. And during it, there was worship. There was dancing. There was a festival to God's glory of seeing about the way that he provided for them, that he led them through the wilderness. Now imagine Jesus is at the temple. All of this is going on, this brilliant light. And into that setting, we see him say this in verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Are you seeing it? because he's using that picture. He's like, this is an amazing light show, but ah, uh, I, I am the light of the world. And see, what we understand, if, we, if you've been in the Bible at all, and, and even outside of the Bible in a lot of cultural contexts and even different religions, light and darkness are symbols. They represent something. And darkness often represents confusion. It represents evil. It represents sin. And light represents God's holiness, his purity, and his truth. And so don't miss what Jesus is saying. Jesus is the source of God's life-giving illumination. And so he's already said this. John uses the whole metaphor of light many times in his gospel and in his subsequent letters. But look what he says in John 1, 4 through 5. In him, Jesus, was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I love that, man. I hope when you read that, you're like, mmm, Mufasa, it's so good. Because here's the deal. What does light do? 
Light dispels darkness. When you turn on a light, it dispels the darkness in a room. There's never been a time where you open the door and the darkness crept in, right? Light dispels darkness. It, it's what it does. And so Jesus, as the light, the world has not overcome it. The darkness has not overcome the light. The light dispels the darkness and it allows us to see clearly the way things truly are. And so what Jesus is saying is, I am the God who opens the eyes of the blind, who brings the prisoners out of the darkness, the God who is the light of life. Jesus is the light of the world. He is God's truth revealed. And by knowing him, we know what is true. So let's unpack that a little bit. I think there's some observations we can make from this that are very important to the way that we understand God. First of all, God's light reveals the truth. Now it reveals the truth about who God is, but it also reveals the truth about who we are and ultimately what our deepest need is. If you go to John chapter three, you may be familiar with it, but John's talking to Nicodemus and there are some statements made. One that you see at football games all the time, right? That, there's a guy in the end zone that holds up the John 3.16 sign. And if you've been raised in the church, you can kind of mumble through that idea that for God so loved the world that he sent his only son, you know? Are you filling it in with me, I hope? <laughs> that's one of those verses that's good to know. <laughs> But have you ever read after that verse? And so we're gonna read after because it's interesting what he says. This is talking about Jesus' mission. Now look at John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Again, that's good news. That's good to reveal God's heart. His intention was to send Jesus into the world to save. Look at verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Now check out the next verse. This is the part you may not, may not remember. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear their deeds will be exposed. This is just the truth that people prefer to live in the darkness than rather step into the light and actually see the content of their deeds, that they are not good, right? It's why people don't TP during the day <laughs> because they'll get caught in that same way. Look at what he says about people that are willing to come into the light. Verse 21. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. They live by the truth according to God's design. Whoever lives by the truth, living according to God's will and purpose, comes into the light, welcoming that light, welcoming that truth and being transformed by it. See, Jesus gives us an understanding of the truth of who he is, and in that we see who we are. We are imperfect. And I hope that's not gonna wreck your day, but you're not perfect. <laughs> and so we're not perfect, we're broken by our sin, and the light of God's truth shines into that situation, that we realize outside of Christ we are not enough. And I see it so often, people trying to convince themselves, I'm enough, I'm good enough, I'm enough, and you're not without Christ. We are broken and lost. Now, sometimes that truth is painful, but I hope you hear this, it is always good. There is freedom in the truth. So God's light, God's truth brings conviction. It's because we were made in the image of God. We were designed to relate to God rightly, but because of sin, that image, who we are, our identity has been twisted in such a way that it cannot be untwisted by the ways we try to improve ourselves. We cannot be the people we were designed to be without Jesus. And so we can't make ourselves better by trying harder. And so we feel the weight of conviction. 
I know, you know, we know that we are not good enough. And so here's the deal, and this is so important if you're feeling that or you've felt that, that many times we view conviction negatively, but whenever God gives us conviction, it's actually an opportunity to be healed and forgiven to be healed and forgiven. When we feel that conviction, it points us to our greatest need, which is God. Now, I I could be really angry. I remember when I had my appendicitis, and it hurts just a little. And so I had appendicitis, and it was not good, and I went to the doctor, and the doctor was like, oh yeah, your appendix is inflamed, and if we don't cut you open and pull it out, it's gonna be really bad. And can you imagine in that moment being like, dude, whatever, you're a jerk. You take that diagnosis and fly it up a kite, buddy. No way. I, my appendicitis, you know, whatever. How ridiculous would that be? And yet so many times when God pinpoints our need and we feel convicted, we do the same thing to him. How dare you tell me that? See, God's conviction is an opportunity for freeness. Freeness. <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> God's opportunity is, this is an opportunity for us to find in Christ the forgiveness from that conviction that allows us to truly live. Now, if you're, if you're a Christian and, and, and you've felt the weight of conviction, it's a matter of responding. If you don't know Jesus and you know that what, the, what God says of you is true, that this is a mirror to your soul, then this is your opportunity. Either way, when conviction comes, it is meant to point us to him. Look at Psalm 32. If you have it in your Bible, you can check it out, or it'll be on the screens. But this is a Psalm of David. And so when you hear David, I know you're thinking like giant killer, stud biscuit. He's an awesome guy. But here's the deal. He's also a wretched sinner, <laughs> Okay, so if you've read the story of David, he's this man after God's own heart, but then he commits adultery, and then he has the husband of the woman he committed adultery with murdered. Brother knows sin, okay? And he also knows conviction, which is what he writes about in Psalm 32. Look at his words. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. Now listen to him describe conviction. See if this doesn't feel like what it feels like for you. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. I think like Kansas City, 99 degrees, 100% humidity. You know that feeling like, oh. Like your soul is weighed down by the conviction of God. Your strength, your energy, your vitality because you know you're not, what you're, you're not doing what you should be doing. You're not who God wants you to be and that weight is so heavy. But look at what he says. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And the best part of this verse, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. See, when the the, the light of the truth of God pierces our heart, it is meant to heal us. We're meant to see who we are and then run to Jesus and that burden of guilt and conviction is lifted by the forgiveness that only Jesus can provide. I love this quote by John Newton. Although my memory's fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner and Christ is a great savior. And that is the truth of the gospel, that if you are a great sinner, amen. <laughs> And if God, and because he is, he is a great savior, amen. Because he has what you need to be forgiven. And there's nothing that you have done, even the stuff you did yesterday, that God cannot forgive. But the truth hurts if we don't respond to it in the way that heals. Secondly, God's light provides direction. See, our world is marked by confusion, amen? Um, if you've been watching television or uh, uh, anything, <laughs> and if not, that's cool too. I, I get you. <laughs> it's like you just have enough sometimes. But our world is marked by confusion. 
Many times we don't know what to believe, and maybe more importantly, we don't know who to believe. The experts line up and point in all directions. And into that confusion, people don't understand what life is all about. I know that I've had moments like that of thinking, what is my purpose? Why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? It's very similar to a man named Jim Marshall who played in the NFL. Now, some of you may remember Jim Marshall. He played for the Minnesota Vikings. And Jim Marshall had the dubious distinction of earning a nickname called Wrong Way Marshall. Now, Jim Marshall was playing in 1964 against the, uh, the 49ers. And the ball was fumbled, and he picked the ball up and ran just about the length of the field to score a touchdown. The only problem is he was running in the wrong way. And so instead of scoring a touchdown, he actually scored a safety against his team. And if you watch the video, which you can go and YouTube this, he is so confidently wrong. <laughs> as he's running, and when he gets in the end zone, he just chucks the ball, and, and then the moment he turns around and kind of sees where he's at, there's a moment of realization that is heartbreaking. <laughs> now, the problem in our culture is we're so confused, we don't know where the end zones are. <laughs> we're hard charging after things that don't matter, and we're ignoring the things that are truly important all too often. And so when Jesus says he is the light of the world, he shines and pierces the darkness of our confusion. He not only shows us how to live, but he shows us what we are living for. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of the world. Whoever follows me, like the Israelites, when they followed the cloud and the pillar of fire, whoever follows me, See, God is not interested in just people who merely give intellectual assent to say, I believe, but we must follow in the way a soldier follows a commanding officer. In, 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 we follow Jesus as our sole commander, as our leader. And if we follow Jesus as his disciple, he guarantees us that we will not walk in darkness. Now, I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. You've probably heard it before, but it's so good. He said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. And that is the truth of who Jesus is. I don't just believe in Jesus because he is real, because of the evidence. All of that is true. But not, it's not just belief in him, but then he reveals what the rest of life is about. The way that we know and understand Jesus, his truth, his light shows us. In a world of confusion, it allows us to know what is important and what is not. And he says those who follow him will not walk in darkness. Now, there are real dangers in walking in darkness. As I've, I've told you before, I, I get up really early on Sundays, which is why I'm so fully caffeinated right now. <laughs> so I come in excited because I've been awake for a while. <laughs> But when I get up, I have to stay quiet because everyone else is sleeping, including my dog. And if I wake her up, then there's food. And then, yeah. So tiptoeing around the house. So it's pitch dark in my house. Now, I don't know who did this, but I, I have a sneaking suspicion that someone in my family did this on purpose. We have a sliding pocket door that closes off our laundry room area. For, and then it blocks off so you can get in the garage so you can open that up. So I go into my garage on Sunday mornings and I, I preach this sermon to my weights. Uh, they're, they're a very receptive audience. <laughs> so I am full stride, right? I'm like, dude, do, 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 do. pitch dark, but I know the kitchen layout pretty well. And this pocket door is closed. I smack that thing so hard, boom! <laughs> roar, 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 roar. Darn it. <laughs> There's a danger in walking in the darkness. You have a nubby little pinky toe on your foot that bears witness that walking in the dark is not a good idea. <laughs> so there's this idea that we can understand that if we are in Christ, we are not meant to walk in the darkness. We're not meant to walk in confusion without purpose. And John will say the same thing in John 12, 46. He records the words of Jesus. 
I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in the darkness. We can't continue to walk in the darkness once we've been brought into what the Bible says, the kingdom of his son, the kingdom of light. Paul will say the same thing in Ephesians 5. He says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. So if you're a follower of Christ, we can no longer walk in darkness, but instead we are called to walk in the light, to walk according to the truth, to live into what we know of God. Finally, God's light gives purpose. This is so cool. Matthew 5, and you may even know where I'm going, but this is so cool because Jesus has just said in John, I am the light of the world. But look at Matthew 5, starting in verse 14. He says, you, this is so cool, yeah, come on now, you are the light of the world. This is so important because we are going to be those who reflect God's light into the world. That as our characters and our, our affection, as our, our hopes and our dreams and our desires are transformed by the power of God, that we reflect that light into a dark world. You, if you're a follower of Christ, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Hide it under a bushel? No. Thank you, church folk. <laughs> okay. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So once we trust in Jesus and, and he works on changing and untwisting our bent and corrupted image-bearing character and straightening it out so we more accurately reflect the character of God into the world, our job is to do that, to bring him glory. Now, I'm going to need some people that were raised in the Lutheran Church to help me on this one. This is from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And the, and the first point there is, what is the chief end of man? Does anybody remember? It is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Okay, so some of us are not Lutheran. That's fine. So, so I love this because the catechism just tries to distill down biblical truth into bite-sized chunks. And so it's not scripture, but this is a pretty good summation of what our point and purpose is in life. What is the purpose of a believer? It is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. I'm so glad that second part is there. And John Piper said it even better that we glorify God by enjoying him forever. That is the truth, my friends. The more deeply we enjoy fellowship, connection with God, the more we, 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 we think about his perfection, his grace, his holiness, his power, the more that we delight in his character and the fact that he saved us, the more we experience that, the more it is our delight to shine his glory into the world by doing the things that he would do if he were us. And so what do we do? We serve, we love, we care. We walk in the truth in such a way that we reflect his character into this world. I had a buddy of mine who got me a survival mirror because I think he thinks that I'm gonna be lost somewhere in the back country. I'm like, brother, I do not go that far out into the wilderness, but if I do, you'll just find my body and your mirror. <laughs> okay? <laughs> but if you've never played with one of those because I still have a sin nature, they are amazing. It's this like high-powered mirror with a little, it's got a little cutout in the middle so you can aim it. And if you target it, you can literally watch people's heads catch on fire. <laughs> you think I'm joking. So, um, <laughs> but here's the thing. That mirror doesn't work worth Boo Radley in the dark. <laughs> doesn't work at all. It is the most purposeless thing to have of the entire universe is a mirror used to save you in the dark. But when it catches the sun and reflects its light, it is powerful. Not because the mirror is powerful, but because the sun is. 
and our lives do the same thing. As we reflect the character of Christ, his mercy, his compassion, his truth, his servant heart, as we show that into the world, it brings glory to God like we were a neon sign painting to the awesomeness of our God. And this is exactly our purpose in life, that we are to love God, glorify him, and enjoy him forever. Now the world is going to think we're crazy And you are, and that's okay. But they're going to think you're crazy too. And this is exactly what happened to Jesus. If you read through the rest of chapter 8, and and go home today, read John 7 and John 8. They're quick. But they think Jesus is crazy. They they think Jesus is, is, he's he's claiming things that make him a false prophet. They think that he's even demon-possessed. They think Jesus, the light himself, is crazy crazy. They're going to think the same thing of you if you live this way. It's going to be so radically different than the world that it can't help but to have an impact. They thought Jesus was crazy to the point at the end of the dialogue in John 8, 58, and I love this section. He's been going back and forth with the Pharisees, who, by the way, are the religious people who are supposed to be the first to accept God when he appears. Okay, side note. (laughs) If you're a religious person, beware. (laughs) You may miss him. Okay, And so he comes, and, and he's, he's debating with the Pharisees, and they keep saying, you're not who you say you are. You're not who you say you are. And then in verse, eight, verse 58, he says, Very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. Oh, oh man. Come on. Wait, that's my king. He's, the religious leaders have been, have been just pounding him. He's like, hey, here's the deal. I know where I came from. I know where I'm going. I'm not confused about my identity, but you fools are. Here's the deal. Before Abraham was, before time itself, and then he uses the description of God, I am who I am, and they know it. So many people are like, oh, Jesus never claimed to be God. Hand those people a Bible. Okay, because it, it's not just like, oh, maybe once or twice. He knew who he was. It's us who were confused. He's not. And they knew it because the Pharisees immediately grabbed stones to kill him because it was blasphemy. They knew what he was saying. And so people are going to think you're crazy if you live this way. Live this way anyway. Don't walk in darkness, but live in truth. Let me give you three quick things. Three quick things, then we're going to go. Just to frame our minds here and some work that God may want to do on your heart. First of all, the encouragement is to know the truth that will set you free. Man, if you're under conviction right now, and maybe there's sin in your life that you are hiding, there's junk in your soul that is festering. And and just like a a rotting something nasty, it's putrid. And you're too afraid to drag it out into the light. There's only healing found when you do that. If you want to be rid of that, man, you've got to bring it before the Lord and confess it. And then with his help, you will walk in freedom. With his help, you can be free of that thing that, that, that anchors you to death. Because sin will never do anything good for you. Know the truth that will set you free. Secondly, follow God's direction in your life as revealed in his word, as applied by his spirit. God's word is not something, it's not an instruction book that we read and discard. It is the way that he has called us to live. He has guided us by his word and his spirit like that burning pillar in the night. This is what we follow. This is how we live out of our love for God because of the grace we have freely received. And finally, let your light shine. Let your life shine in a world of darkness. Our world seemingly is getting darker by the minute. And in this culture, too often we as Christians contribute to that darkness. We aren't joy bringers, life bringers, truth sayers. We're just cranky pants. (laughs) And honestly, I I, I mean sincerely for you and for me, knock it off. (laughs) God calls us to be light bearers. Not that we are the light, but that we reflect it. And my friends, when we do, not just in our words, but in our love and in our service of others, that's 
what changes things, as God works through us. Man, if we did that, it would change things. Just in your life, if we did these things, it would change things. So let's pray that we'll have the strength to step into what God has called us to this morning for his glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Your word cuts, but it heals. Your word cleans and it restores. And as we have heard from your son Jesus this morning, and your Holy Spirit has stirred up within our hearts the things that you are calling us to respond to, I pray for each one of us, because you have loved us so well, that we would respond. For some of us, that means making a first-time decision to trust that you are the light of the world. For some of us, it means a decision to call that sin in our lives out into the light that it might be exposed and destroyed. That we wouldn't live in the secret shame, but instead we would embrace real freedom and hope. And for all of us, no matter where we are at, you have called us to bear light into the world. And so, Father, in our homes, Father, in our, in our places of work, in our families, and in our community, may we be known as those who reflect your character into this world. God, that we would live to glorify you and enjoy you forever. We thank you for your promises and for the truth of your word. May we walk in the light and not in the darkness. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.